All right. Welcome once again, my friends, to another episode here, the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A here on the RDP YouTube channel, where we take a fundamental approach to diet and exercise for far greater results that actually last. As always, I'm Matt Schifferly from the Red Delta Project. And today's episode is sponsored by, well, everything. All of the resources that I'm going to be mentioning in this episode, including my favorite isometric equipment and suspension training from NOSC and all of the books of the RDP library, including things like grind style calisthenics, micro workouts, and calisthenics and bodyweight training for martial arts. All the links are down below in the description for the reference, and all of that helps to support the show. So today is just kind of a, a collection, a potpourri, if you will, of some of the biggest game-changing ideas and lessons that I've come across over the past year or so that really kind of shifted the perspective on how I help people approach diet and exercise. And of course, all of these are things that I address in my usual YouTube channel and so on, but I wanted to kind of collect it all together into a single handy episode that you can digest right now, because it's only gonna take one of these things to make a significant difference in how you approach your diet and exercise. So let's hedge our bets and cover a lot more ground as well. And also just because uh, I need to address it, this is a live feed that I'm doing now on Friday evening. It's 5.30 here in Denver, Colorado. And I usually do these things on Saturday afternoons, but it's been very problematic for me to hold these live Q and A's on Saturday afternoon. I always have things popping up, things are getting planned. And if I'm completely honest, it's been quite difficult for me on my schedule because I do this at like 2.30 in the afternoon and it basically just puts a hole right in the middle of my day. So it's a little bit problematic. So I'm trying this out Friday evening. Maybe this is a better time for some folks. I know it's not going to be the best time for others, but uh, we'll see how this goes. I'd love to hear your feedback in the comments section. Folks are coming on in. How's it going, CJ Watson? Good to talk to you and everybody. But ask your questions freely and I will answer them as I can get to them. All right, so let's jive right on in. Uh, point number one, game changing uh, point number one here. This is going to be something that's going to make a big difference to those who are interested in weight management or weight loss, because there's a lot of stuff in our fitness culture that is all about helping people become a little bit more in gear with burning fat, like burning fat, this burn fat, this workout burns fat. How do you become fat adapted? How do you have a diet that helps you burn more fat and carbohydrates and everything? And the big lesson here is it probably doesn't really matter what you're burning. So personally, I could burn fat, I could burn carbs, I don't care because both are equally beneficial for your health. Both are equally beneficial for your weight loss. Both are equally beneficial for health and performance. And I think the big mistake would be to actually try to be someone who burns primarily considering fat and or carbohydrate. And this is basic human physiology. When I was taking nutrition courses and kinesiology, kinesiology in school and stuff, we learned that the human body is very well adapted to burn a mixture of fat and carbohydrate, protein too, to some degree, depending on your circumstances, and that it's kind of not so much interchangeable, but the body is very well uh, versed at being able to do well with either. And there, believe it or not, before the whole fat adapted keto thing came about and stuff, there were books out there helping people say, you know what, if you really want to lose weight, if you really want to be healthy, if you really want to have your best performance, you need to focus on burning carbohydrates, not fat. And I won't get too much into the details in the weeds right now, just because we're kind of short on time. It would be too much to go into, but go check out the book, Strong Medicine by Marty Gallagher. And there was a co-author whose name is blanking on me right now. But Marty Gallagher, if you didn't know, is one of the most premier strength coaches in, well, if not the world, in the United States for sure. He turns weaklings into absolute beasts. And the basic premise of that book, amongst others that uh, came out around the same time, were burn and manage your carbohydrates for things like weight loss and weight management performance and all these other sorts of things. And this is typically what ends up happening within our fitness culture, is the pendulum swings towards one side of things usually fat or carbohydrate, and then it swings to the other side, and then it keeps swinging back and forth. And we learned this in our nutrition class. I remember, because this was back in 1970s, back in the day, and my uh, nutrition professor talked about how 
in the earlier stages of our fitness culture is like, it was all about trying to uh, limit carbohydrate, limit carbohydrate and eat more fat. And this was in the mid nineties. And many of us, myself included, were all about the low fat craze and everything. I was like, that's ridiculous. You know, thank God we're all no better now. That, that's the stupidest diet approach now. And he told us in that class, he's like, mark my words, the low carb craze is going to hit again. It's going to become low carb. Everything's going to be low carb, low sugar and everything like that. And they're going to encourage you to eat fat. And I was like, that's nuts. And of course, you know, several years later, about five, 10 years later, the Atkins thing hit uh, big and it's been going that way ever since. And it's just this pendulum going back and forth. But if you really want some sanity in your diet, if you really want to have the best chance of managing weight, of managing your health and managing all these other things, don't worry about what you're burning. Don't worry about whether you're burning fat or carbohydrates. Just burn it. Just get it expended. Burn it because calories going out of your body are going to promote a caloric deficit regardless of why they're being burned, regardless of what you're burning, regardless of whether it's fat or carbohydrates. Both of them are going to have their own beneficial aspects to it. So don't worry about, am I burning fat? Am I burning carbohydrates? These days, a lot of the technology is coming out. It's like, you can know, you know, doing like the metabolic and the thing you breathe in and your metabolism and are you burning fat or carbs or whatever? The fact of the matter is, don't worry about it. You're better off not worrying about it because as long as you are burning what you can, there's big benefits to burning carbohydrates. There's big benefits to burning fat. And there's bigger benefits to burning both. And if you try to try try to focus on burning one at the exclusion of the other, that's probably going to be more on the detrimental side. So burn both. Don't worry too much about it. Just get out, exercise, and do what you like. Let's see if we got some questions coming on in. Michael's coming on. Uh, everybody check out Michael's page here. I got uh, <clears throat> his latest book, Temple Maintenance on Using Bands and so on. And uh, his uh, stuff is fantastic. So thanks very much, everybody. All right, so that's point number one. Point number two. Okay, so this is a new one here. So if you're not familiar with my work, all of my books that I've written and stuff, uh, all of the, the Grind Style Calisthenics Workout Program, which is an entire year of calisthenics programming for building muscle and strength with bodyweight training, I always organize everything in tension chains. It's not by muscles, it's not by movements, it's tension chains, which is kind of like a combination of the two. Okay, so this is old hat, that's not the lesson, right? We got our three movement chains, push, pull, and squat. And then we've got our three support chains. Those are the three classic anatomical chains, flexion, AKA and the uh, anterior chain, extension, posterior chain, and lateral chains. So we are often told that basics for the win when it comes to strength and conditioning. The basic movements, the most basic exercises out there, push-ups, pull-ups, bench press, deadlifts, squats, lunges, these sorts of things. But we're never told why. Why is it basics for the win? Why is it the most basic, boring, not very fancy stuff works best? Well, there's two reasons for that. The first of which is that the, quote, basic, boring exercises are full tension chain exercises. They're the ones that use the entire tension chain from their origin to the insertion. So for pushing, it's everything on the pushing muscles, the, the chest, the shoulders, the triceps, the extensors, every muscle that's involved in the push chain is used with basic pushing movements. Same thing with pull chains, same thing with squat chain and so on. So these basic exercises, first and foremost, they use all of the muscles in that tension chain. So that's the first advantage to them. The second advantage is that basic fundamental exercises are also the easiest way to get a lot of tension and to create that tension as long as possible within that entire length of the chain. So if we're doing push-ups, I can make that ridiculously hard on myself, either with weight vests or progressive technique like archer push-ups and stuff. I can make it really, 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 really heavy couple that with something like, you know, a lot of times I would do like single joint stuff. It'd be really a lot harder to make the muscle work as hard as I wanted to, because it didn't have the support of the other muscles. And it was more of almost about trying to control the body in relative to this really weird kind of awkward exercise. That's why we had to invent equipment, things like preacher curls and stuff, because it's hard to adequately work muscles in this piecemeal fashion. We had to invent things. 
So when it comes to our best exercises for helping you build muscle and strength, it's not so much compound movements, it's full tension chain exercises, things that use the entire chain in one fell movement. So the thing, basic push, basic pull, basic squatting movements, right? When it comes to extension work, anything that is ground-based that uses the entire length of the posterior chain. So we're thinking deadlifts, Romanian deadlifts, kettlebells, swings, power cleans, bridge work if you're into calisthenics, isometric deadlifts, and so on. Flexion chains, again, we don't want to isolate. We want to integrate. We want as much muscle involved into it as possible. So these are hanging leg raises, sit-ups where maybe your feet are anchored down, anything that's got the entire length of the front side of the body going. And then, of course, full lateral support and or twisting movements for the side chain. So it's not about what exercise is best. It's not about what type of new things or equipment is coming down the, the pipe. It's all about how do we integrate and utilize the entire full tension chain with a very basic stable exercise. So that way stability and other qualities are not the limiting factor in it. And that way it gives you the best bet of pushing your muscles with as much tension as possible for strength for as long as possible for endurance and maxing out the muscular work capacity for creating the strongest stimulus for hypertrophy. So it's all about those full tension chain movements. And I'm not saying that's all you should ever do. By all means, hit the bicep curls, tricep pushdowns, calf raises, that sort of thing. That's great, but it's supplemental movements. Why? Because those are partial chain exercises. They take a part of that chain and they help you work on weak links. But if it's not really that much of a weak link, it's probably not going to be that much more beneficial for you. All right, any more questions? No, no, no questions. I keep on going, that, very good. All right, <clears throat> excuse me, and get some water here. Okay, so tip number three. Now this one goes with relative to the fact that we are drowning these days, my friends, in information. And I'm old enough to know a time before the internet when the internet started to become a thing uh, and it was like this new fad. A lot of uh, millennials and Gen Zers may not be able to relate to this very much. But uh, the thing is, I remember one time, I think it was for Cisco or something. There was some tech company that had an advertisement a commercial on TV. And there was this guy and, she, and he was like chatting up this girl at this party or something. And he asked her like, you know, sheepishly, can I have your number? And she's like, yeah, sure. And she hands him an email address. And, and I saw that and my mind was just kaboom, like blown away. Like, oh my gosh, people are going to be communicating on computers. Oh, whoa. Like this is real high level futuristic stuff, you know, back the, in the day. So that was like what I grew up with, the, the birth of the internet and the, the, the increasing popularity of using the internet and stuff. And so back in the day, it was believed that the internet was going to solve all our problems. It was going to give us all the information we needed and tell us everything we needed to know about how to solve the biggest mysteries of life and how to solve all our personal problems. Of course, I'm sure as you know now, that doesn't happen. <laughs> if anything, it's contributed to a lot of these sorts of things. But nonetheless, there's still this subliminal thought in the back of our mind that the answers and solutions we need in order to, how do I lose weight? How do I build muscle? How do I get a good workout program? All these sorts of big questions are going to be solved by finding the answers on the internet. And the first thing we need to understand about that is that is not at all the case because we get so much trapped into paralysis by analysis. And the more information we find, it's like the more screwed over we are. It's like, well, this guy says to do work a muscle once a week. And this guy says every day. And this guy says one set is enough. And this guy says, we got to do at least five sets and all these other sorts of things that could fill the information. And I don't even know what to do anymore. In a way, it was almost better that I started to grow up without the internet because you would just take an idea and run with it. And you would get your information that way. So here's the thing is the internet is a great place for information. The internet's a great place for ideas. It's a horrible place for solutions. Why? Because real honest solutions can only be found through experience. And I think that's the big lesson that we need to take away is that while the internet's such a great place, you can't get much experience from it. 
All right, I can watch YouTube videos all day long about how to uh, do something, but until I roll up my sleeves and actually start doing the thing, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Case in point, right? I'm talking on my new Sony uh, camera here. You know, I used to make all my videos and stuff on my cell phone and things like that, like a lot of beginners do. I was doing that for like 15 years, <laughs> but I finally stepped up and got like a real actual camera. And I'm like, I don't know how to use this thing and stuff like that. And I would watch videos after videos, after videos, after videos. And so much time I spent on YouTube trying to figure out how to use this camera. When what I really needed to do was I took some videos. I'm like, oh, these are what the things do. And I didn't learn how to use the camera until I actually went outside. I'm like, I'm just going to walk around and just shoot photos all day long and video all day long. And I'm going to change every setting 20 different ways. And it was through that experience that I finally learned how to use the darn camera. So when it comes to this new age of social media information and hacks and everything, I know the ironic thing of <laughs> saying this on a podcast here, but the fact of the matter is the real information you need is not going to come from internet. It's not going to come from scrolling on social media. You could scroll through TikTok and Instagram for the rest of your life and not get even close to the information you really need that you can get from 10 minutes of experience. So we need to change our value of all I need from the internet is a place to start. All I need is an idea. All I need is some piece of information of what's a good way for me to work out in the morning or something. And someone's like, oh, I recommend having this coffee and do it on an empty stomach. Great, good, you're done. You know, Close down the computer, now you apply. Because the real information you need is gonna come from your experience. So then you go and you try it and your body's gonna give you all sorts of feedback. You're gonna get all sorts of information and you gotta trust that as well because there's a lot in our fitness culture that tells you not to trust yourself, not to trust your body, not to trust your feedback. But that's the actual information you really need because that's what's going to tell you the direction you need to go in. That's the thing that's going to tell you you should be doing more work or less work or change things up. So experience is more valuable than research in the uh, quoted terms. All right. Let's see what we can do for some questions. I know I, I missed a couple here. Let's see. And again, for those who are new on this podcast, I know we're getting new people because it's a new time. If you put a hey, Matt in the comments section that I know that's directed to me because I know a lot of people, they talk amongst themselves and uh, that way I know what's directed to me versus at each other. But Wasatch Wizard coming on, uh, how long does Matt usually stream? I'm torn, I wanna listen, but also need to work. <laughs> See, case in point, that wasn't to me, there we go. So uh, I usually stream for about an hour, uh, maybe a little bit less, give or take. And also remember folks that I always post the audio to this to the local podcast directories, local pod, what's a local podcast directory? all podcast directories within 24 hours too. So if you miss these, uh, you could just subscribe to the Red Delta Project uh, podcast wherever you get podcasts and you're gonna get this as well. You won't be able to ask me the questions live, but you can also ask me questions at Red Delta Project on Instagram as well. San Diego, good to see you, my friend. Emma, I tried those uh, partial chain movements for an entire year and now that I use multi-joint exercises, my tension is totally fragmented. I had, tar had a hard time taking advantage of pull-ups, yes. So this is exactly what happened to me too. You know, I kind of grew up with a lot of the bodybuilder approach to things where it's like, okay, back and biceps day. So I do like lat pullovers and rear flies on the machine and bicep curls. And it was all piecemealed and fragmented kind of thing. And maybe I would finish with a set of pull-ups or something like that. So yeah, fragmentation is uh, kind of a bit of an issue with that. So when we get back into full tension chain exercises, like pull-ups, rows and stuff, you may feel like it's a little bit disjointed or that some areas are feeling a little bit more than others, like a, you know, grip or maybe the back of the shoulders, for example, something is feeling like a weak link. And to that, I always recommend people just keep working that movement and that weak link will eventually strengthen up and no longer be a weak link. And then it'll be the next weak link and the next one and so on. And then the whole thing works together as a cohesive unit. Also coupled with that as well, whenever we are doing single joint stuff, like let's say bicep curls, for example, we still want to make sure we're engaging the entire tension chain. So if I'm leaning back, because, you know, I love my suspension straps. So I'm doing bicep curls on suspension trainers. I may be focusing on my biceps working. 
but I'm still packing the shoulders. I'm still engaging my lats. I'm still using my rear deltoids. I'm still using my traps in, if nothing else, in isometric fashion. But when I'm using single joint stuff, I'm moving at one joint, but I'm still trying to use the entire chain for the sake of support, for the sake of stability, for the sake of control. And that's going to not only help you get much more tension in the target muscle, but it's also going to keep that connectivity and make sure everything's working together so that way it doesn't become nearly as fragmented. All right. More questions here. Nitpick. Critic. Hey, man. I've been eating yogurt, omelets, bananas, almonds, chicken breast, broccoli. Awesome. Sweet potatoes in their uh, respective times. Trying to add muscle. I know it's slow, but should I do more? Oh, this is all uh, such a good question because that question is always in the back of our mind. Should I do more? Am I doing enough? I need to be doing more. Shouldn't I be doing more? Am I doing enough? It's It just gnaws at you, right? Because you never have this sense that you've done enough, right? You always need to do more. And I covered this in a uh, shorter video on my YouTube channel earlier this week of like, at what point do you know you've done enough work for it to be effective in your workout? So this is where a fundamental approach to fitness comes into play. Because when we understand how fitness works on a fundamental level, we understand that what makes it work is, are we accomplishing a fundamental objective? Okay, we have a target that we're trying to hit. So if you were like, say, throwing darts, because that's what I do, I'm gonna go and throw darts at a blind draw tonight. We have a definitive target. And I'm gonna keep throwing until I can hit that target. Once I hit the target, I know I'm done, right? And that's what fundamental objectives do, is they give us a target and say, you hit that target, you're done, you've gotten enough. So looking at diet, right? What is diet trying to do? The fundamental objective to diet is to satisfy our four primal appetites that I talk about in my first book, Fitness Independent. Shameless plug, link is down below, right? So these four primal things, because there's a lot of stuff out there telling us all sorts of information, usually from the internet, on what our diet is supposed to be, which is basically a guessing game. You're supposed to eat this many calories. Well, who the hell knows that? There's so many influences to your caloric needs and they're always changing left and right every single day. How in the world can one number possibly be enough or a, sub, a, a good enough number? Same with protein intake, right? How much is enough? You can find a general formula like you know 1.2 grams per pound of body weight and stuff, but again, it's an estimated guess at best. But when we have an objective of what we're trying to do with our diet, then we know if we're doing enough. So these four primal appetites, primal appetite number one, hunger. You got to eat enough to satisfy your hunger. Okay? Not so much that you're feeling stuffed and full and, oh God, I can't believe I ate the whole thing, but you got to satisfy your hunger, my friends. So you're not going through your day going like, oh my gosh, I'm famished, but I'm not supposed to eat again for another several hours. If you're hungry, eat. Okay? So you should feel a good satisfaction of hunger. Number two, satisfying nutritional requirements. This is generally something that we can uh, accomplish if we just have a good amount of nutritious foods in our diet, and maybe a multivitamin or some a supplement or two if, if you want to just kind of shore up and fill in the cracks, but it's usually not that necessary. So if you're ever really curious about that, get some blood work done and say, guys, am I missing anything? Am I low in deficiency and stuff like that? Most of the time, no, but that's a good way to know. You don't guesswork this sort of thing. Go and get some blood work done. And usually people are low in vitamin D, but most of the time it's, it's good. Number three, uh, energy uh, support. So a lot of times this came about, again, when a lot of people were going low carb, a lot of people were doing some sort of like restrictive eating style, like fasting and stuff. And they'd come into the gym and they'd be like, oh, my do it diet. It's great. It's awesome. It's wonderful. And then 20 minutes into their workout, they'd be like, Oh, I have no energy. I'm like, you never have any energy in your workouts. You haven't made it through a full hour yet. Like, what is going on? And they'd be like, well, I'm on this new diet and stuff. Like, your energy support is terrible. You have no metabolic support because you're barely eating anything or your diet is so restrictive of carbohydrate or whatever that you just have no fuel in the tank. Get some rice, you know, have, bump up the caloric numbers and stuff. You want to feel like you are supporting your metabolic needs and you have energy for whatever activities you need to do. And then number three, of course, is are you satisfying your taste and your palatability, your emotional need for food? 
This is very important. Food satisfies far more than our body. It's part of our life. It's a social component. It's something that we do for the sake of our holistic well-being in our lifestyle. So I don't care if you're 2% body fat, you're going to live to be 120 and you have energy coming out of your ears. If you're always fighting cravings and you feel like you're just consumed with food and how you can stay on your diet, I'd say your diet still sucks because it's not doing that. So long way around it, nitpick, is if you are getting those four things satisfied adequately, I'd say you're probably doing enough. I'd say your diet's pretty good. And if you're ever curious, eat more and see what happens. Chances are nothing. You know, because usually when a diet is not adequate, it's one of those four things is, is very noticeably lacking. I got cravings all the time. I'm always hungry. I'm always tired and feeling like I can't get through my workouts. And I'm basically like feeling like I'm always off because my nutritional support is off. Deficiencies in a diet are usually pretty self-evident. Uh, so if you don't have those things, then I would say you're probably doing enough because you know you're hitting your targets. You know you have your objectives met. When you have your objectives met, congrats, you're doing enough. Move on and tackle other things. Okay, let's get into more of our topics here. So uh, the last one I talked about, action is the best, quote, research. All right, this this one is one I wish I knew years ago uh, when it comes down to the ability to actually get results. And that is that uh, hard work doesn't get results. You can work your ass off for years and go nowhere. Trust me, I've done it. Trust me, most people do that. This whole idea that you gain or you make progress based on how much you work and blood, sweat, and tears you put in is a complete lie. Yes, you can make some initial progress just with putting in more effort when you're starting out, when you're a beginner. But the fact of the matter is most people are going to work really hard and not get what they want when it comes to, well, not only fitness, but life in general. There's no guarantee at all that hard work will ever pay off, but we love to feel a sense of satisfaction. We, some people, they even post their ego on how hard they're working. Like, I'm the hardest worker in the room. I can outwork anybody. Okay, great, but that's not something to be proud of. That's like being proud of our participation trophy. It's like, look at my collection of participation trophies. Did you ever win a game? <laughs> Did you ever win a champion? Well, I wasn't really that good as a player. It's like, then it's a false positive kind of thing. You don't get results from hard work. You get results from improvement, my friends. Improvement. How is your workout better now than it was last time you did it? Or better last week, right? Some way, shape, or form. We need our mindset focusing on improving, improving, improving. You can work your ass off for years and never improve one iota. Again, I've done it. It sucks because it sucks to be working as hard as you can and nothing ever happens. So we want to seek improvement and just work as necessary in order to achieve that improvement. Again, this is where the objectives come into play. When your objective is to just work hard, you just endlessly work yourself into the ground and you set yourself up for all sorts of like overworking and stress and all these other sorts of things. And you never feel like you're doing enough. But I had a guy come into the gym today. I was training him and he was, he was kind of in rough shape. He had quite the party night last night. He's like, dude, I am so hungover. I'm so tired. I am just, I was like, no problem, dude. It's all good. I was like, here we go. Dips. You know, last time you did five dips. See if you could do more, two sets. And he got eight sets, uh, eight repetitions on two sets. I'm like, good, you're done. And he's like, well, I didn't do that much. I'm like, I don't care. It's an improvement. You went from five to eight for both sets. That's a big improvement. That's a big progression, especially percentage wise for your repetitions. I don't care how much work that took. I don't care if you can do another million sets or not. You improved. And that's the thing that's important. And the guy's been steadily getting stronger and building muscle and improving his physique over the past several years, purely because of this. We're not driving him into the ground. In fact, we purposely changed his workout around so he wasn't being driven in the ground because initially he would end his workouts just completely spent, laying on the floor. He's like, okay, just give me a minute. Oh, okay, I'll get up in about five minutes kind of thing. I was like, no, this isn't gonna work. You need to walk out of the gym, not crawl out of the gym. And once we started to get him to a place by curtailing down his workload, where he wasn't driving himself into the ground, he started making progress a lot faster 
And the results came a lot faster. Why? Because it was getting improvement rather than just blood, sweat, and tears, hard work and effort. So I used to be one of those hard work and like, I would work out at, work, outwork anybody here. My workout is 10 times harder than anyone else here. It's like, yeah, so what? No one cares. You know, you don't get results from hard work. You get results from improvement. And when you focus on that, the results come a lot easier and they're a lot easier to maintain as well. All right. Let's see what else we can get here. Dreamer is asking, hey, Matt, does carb loading have much, if any, significance in terms of muscle fullness? Say I want to try to look as big as possible temporarily. Should I get as much carbs as possible? It might. But it's not so much carb loading as it is water loading. Remember that a gram of carbohydrate generally carries roughly about three grams of water. So a lot of times weight fluctuations due to fluctuations in carbohydrate is water fluctuations. And of course, water fluctuations in the muscle can make it feel more full. And there's all sorts of different ways of looking at this. Some people would be like, I want more carbohydrate and glycogen in the muscles because then I have more water and that makes it feel full. But then again, if I have more water, that doesn't make it look as hard and as cut. So it's kind of always this balancing act between the two sort of thing. But um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of like carb loading, so to speak, because I just eat carbs all the time and it's a fairly decent amount of carbohydrates. So I never feel like I really need to load carbohydrate. Um, I know a lot of times carb loading uh, friends of mine and uh, would do this before like running a marathon or something. And they're just like, I just want to make sure I'm topped up. I just want to make sure I've got as much glycogen as possible because I'm going to need it for that long marathon and stuff. But I don't think it's going to make that much difference. As long as you have some basic amount of carbohydrate in your muscles, go a day or two with some more carbohydrate than normal. See if it makes a difference. It might make a little bit of a difference but I would guess that it's probably starting to split hairs. And that, that's uh, gonna be one of those, again, go with experience. Yeah, that's gonna be your research. Will it matter? Will it not? Everybody's a little different from it. You may have a friend who's like, dude, I did the carb loading, didn't make any difference. Another friend could be like, dude, I did the carb loading. I look at, you know, very swole from that sort of thing. It's all over the place. You never quite know until you give it a try. So, you know, have some waffles uh, in the morning and some pancakes and see if that makes a difference for you. All right, new ideas, new ideas. Let's keep going here. Um, this is for those who are using different methodologies, training methodologies, okay? So a lot of times this is about body weight training versus weights or isometrics, or sometimes people are like, okay, I'm gonna go from free weights to machines or something along those lines. So a lot of times when people change up their modality, their exercise modality, <clears throat> they start asking, well, how do I program these sorts of things? Uh, how do I change up the programming so that way I know I'm still going to make progress with this thing? And the big mistake that people often make is that the uh, training method changed, so they changed the programming, which is a big mistake because a lot of times the method you do doesn't really matter <laughs> very much. Always remember, we want to take things to the fundamental level. What is the muscle doing? And a big mistake that people make is when they change the programming, they're changing what the muscles are fundamentally doing, and then they get a different result. Let me give you a classic example. This happens all the time. Someone's in the weightlifting world, right? And they're doing bench press. And they're like, yeah, I like this, but man, my shoulders, they're not so happy with the bench press anymore sort of thing. I'm doing like a five by five with uh, 225, 285, whatever weight would be fairly heavy for that individual. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so then they're like, okay, I'm going to get into calisthenics training. And so they're like, all right, here's an app on how to do hundred pushups. So then their workout goes from doing five by five with a heavy weight to trying to do hundred repetitions in one shot and things change understandably. So, and a lot of times they end up losing their muscle and strength to a large degree. And they're like, yeah, calisthenics didn't work for me. It's like, no, it had nothing to do with the calisthenics. It was the fact that you totally changed up your programming. It'd be no different than if you're doing five by five with that 225, and then you stripped off the plates and you're like, I'm just gonna lift 65 pounds for, and try and get hundred reps. That's fundamentally what you just did. So always remember when you're looking at different modalities, whether you're combining modalities or just changing over to another modality, the programming shouldn't be any different. Whatever you did with one modality, you do the exact same thing with the other. The reps stay the same, the sets stay the same, the programming is, everything's the same, nothing changes. 
because what we're trying to do is fundamentally expose the muscles to the same stimulus. And if you're changing up to a large degree, the sets and the reps and all sorts of different programming variables, you're changing what the muscles are doing. And it doesn't matter what the method is, you've just changed what the muscles are getting exposed to as far as the stimulus goes. So we don't need to worry about what method is better, what method is going to be the most effective or the most productive and stuff, because it's not about the method, it's about the programming of the method. And whenever we use a method and we're not getting the results from it, that's because we're not programming it correctly. And this gives you the freedom to use the methods that align with your preferences and your resources and your abilities far greater. And if you're changing up the programming, then you're changing up what the method is doing for you. But you don't need to worry about that. You can do lots of different things. You can do all sorts of different dietary approaches, all sorts of different methods when it comes to exercise and training and stuff. You have a lot of freedom to do what you want, but just keep the programming the same because when you change up the programming, then things get really off the rails. Mega Chan TV says, hey, Matt, big fan. Thank you very much for coming on in. How to incorporate strength training with sports? I find myself having very little time or energy for resistance training after practice and feel bad for not working out. Absolutely. It always depends on the sport, of course. Yes. I mean, I've written two books on sport conditioning using bodyweight training. Uh, there's bodyweight training for martial arts and bodyweight training for cycling, which also just applies to other endurance things like cross-country running and things like that. Being an old uh, bike racer myself, and bodyweight training works really well for those disciplines. But this is a very good uh, question here. And the big mistake that a lot of people make is they actually put too much time and energy and effort into their strength training and not enough for sports. Happens all the time in the martial arts field. Uh, I had a guy one time who was putting so much time in the gym that he hardly had time and energy for his actual martial arts training. And when it came time to be on the mat or in the ring, he got absolutely decimated because he sucked as a martial artist. He was really good in the gym, but he wasn't training in his martial art nearly as well. So always remember this, my friends, that by far the bulk of what's gonna make you a good athlete is training for the sport, okay? If you could be the best in the gym, and still suck as an athlete because you don't train for the sport. And I know plenty of people, martial artists, bike racers, skiers, and so on in my disciplines, and they are destructively lethal competitors. They don't do any strength training at all. Would they be better with strength training? Sure. But would it really make that much difference? Not really. No. No. In some sports, it makes more of a difference than not. If you're a linebacker in the NFL, yeah, that's going to, or football at, at all, that's going to make a big difference. But in all honesty, like as a bike rider and racer, would making my legs a lot stronger make much difference? Not really. Not really. So it kind of depends on the sport that you're doing. It kind of depends on uh, what type of aspects of the sport you're lacking in. Uh, like if you're lacking leg strength as, say, a uh, tennis player, then, yeah, that can definitely help for sure because you're shoring up a weak link. But by and large, strength training is a supplemental discipline. It's a supplemental thing in your athletic career. It's not meant to be a big deal. It's not to, meant to be a huge thing. In fact, I would say that if you really kind of dialed in what the functional demands are of a given sport, you can probably cover those in no more than four or five exercises. It's not going to take a whole heck of a lot. But because strength training is such a big deal for a lot of people now, that we make it a much bigger thing than it needs to be. That's why in both my bodyweight training for martial arts and cycling, I created programming templates that were basically like, here's a five minute program, go for it. You know, here's something you can do in 10 minutes because the big thing that we don't want is an interference effect where we put so much time and energy into strength training that our ability to train and utilize the body for the sport gets compromised. And then strength training is hurting your performance. And it's hurting your practice, which is very counterproductive uh, and that sort of thing. So the, the thing to always remember, again, is those objectives. Okay? The objectives that we want to accomplish in our training. So most of the objectives for your sport are going to be accomplished in the actual sport training. So Mega Chan is saying it's about uh, martial arts training. So yeah. 
martial arts training, that's like 90% of everything you need to be a good martial artist. So then it just comes down to a few qualities for what you need. And generally that's push, pull, squat for the most part, for the most part. So push, pull, squat, like get 10 jumps in, 10 plyo push-ups, and get in some rows. Do two rounds of that. That's probably all you're going to need. Or jump lunges, right? Build that explosive power and uh, have the ability to hold the bottom position for about 10 seconds. And boom, there you go. You could probably get it done in about 10 minutes. Um, it's not the sort of thing you're going to need to spend a lot of time on. You know, it's what uh, always go into your training with the understanding of what objective are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to do better? Don't just work for the sake of work and hope it's going to pan out in the end. Because that's the foolish way to go about it. That's throwing stuff at the wall and hoping something sticks. But you, because of your dedication to your martial art, you have limited time, you have limited energy, and you have probably limited you know, space and other resources you can work with. So you've got to make sure that every second that you are spending in your strength and conditioning has to be productive. And when you're working to, for the sake of work and you don't know what your objective is, you're just shooting blind into the dark and hoping to hell you hit something. Right? It's like in the martial arts, you're just throwing your arms out there and hoping you hit something by chance versus being very skillful, proficient, and being able to you know, reach out with your fist and just graze the sideburns of your opponent. It's about being precision. So what qualities do you need in your martial arts to condition for? That's the thing to ask yourself. What are the functional qualities? Is it power? Is it strength? Is it explosiveness? Is it control? And so forth. The, that book has all the different types of exercises, but you're not meant to do all of them at once by any means. You can certainly have just a set of jump lunges, let's say 20, a set of plyo push-ups, and a set of heavy rows, and that's it. That'll take care of you. Do a couple sets of that twice a week, you're done. Right? When more you focus on your fundamental objectives of what you need in your martial art, the more you can focus in on exactly what you need from your strength training. And that's going to make it a lot simpler and easier. <clears throat> Another you know, a couple of questions streamers asking, am I a boxing fan? I don't know boxing from a hole in the wall, to be honest with you. I never really got into the boxing thing. I had some friends growing up as a kid uh, who were big boxing fans. And I just never fell into that world a whole lot. I'm not exactly sure why. I, I don't even know who's who in the boxing world these days. Dan Osek is asking, hey, Matt, been using 3 by 15 a second protocol with the isochain for eight weeks. If I switch to a 6 by 6 which is mainly strength, will I still build set build size? Honestly, I don't think it's going to matter uh, very much. And here's why. is because with the – I know I'm going to sound hypocritical here because I just talked about how programming is the same. With isometrics, actually, it's different because with isometrics, you're always putting max tension into the muscle regardless of the protocol. So for example, you've got three by 15, okay? Now, that first six seconds of that 15 second hold is gonna be exactly the same as the six seconds you have by a six by six because it's not like weight lifting, right? If you are like, I'm going heavy today and you lift something you can only lift five times, you've got a lot of tension in the muscle to make that happen. But if you're like, okay, I'm gonna go with higher rep, then you need a lighter weight. And then for the first one that you're lifting, you're creating less tension in the muscle. And this is one of the advantages of isometrics is your tension's always max, regardless of what you're doing for duration. And then you're just holding it as long as you can, as best you can for a longer period of time. So this is why I even made a video, uh, boy, it was a while ago, it was several months ago, where I almost said, you know, when it comes to isometrics, I don't think the programming really matters very much because fundamentally you do the same thing with your muscles all programming methods. You hold for six seconds, you hold for 15 seconds, your muscles basically doing the same thing either way. So I don't think it really matters, to be honest with you. I don't think it's really going to change anything. Now we could really nitpick and be like, yeah, but six seconds, you're holding a higher degree of tension and you're not going into quite as much fatigue. But then again, more sets. So the fatigue may be building up, but it, then again, it depends on the rest periods between and the focus and the constant. Da, 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 da. You know, I think we're starting to get really nitpicky. Is there a difference somewhere? Probably. Is it really going to matter? Probably not. 
So this is the way I always look at isometrics though, especially with the ISO chain, because you're getting get that feedback is do whichever one just feels the best for you. <laughs> because I, when I started using the ISO chain, you know, they had the six second protocol, which was fairly standard. And I was like, this feels good, but I just want, oh, I just want more time. So then I started going with 20 second protocols. And for some exercises, it'd be like, God, this 20 seconds just will not end. It's too long. So then I was like, yeah, a little down. And, and I found that just for me, 12 seconds seems to be the magic number. I don't know why. I, I just like the 12 seconds on the ISO chain. So that may be the way to go. You know, again, trust your experience. Do the six by six, do the, the three by 15. I'm willing to bet it's not going to really matter as long as you're just kind of burning out the muscle. That's the thing that's going to be triggering your hypertrophy. And you're going to probably get there no matter what. So do it either way, but you may find that you're going to work the muscle more effectively one way or the other. And a lot of times that's just how your tinker works. Some people, they just like to have certain protocols. They just jive with it more. And that's what you're looking for with that is just what feels best. Because ultimately, I don't think it's going to matter a whole heck of a lot one way or the other. <clears throat> well, such wizard coming on again. Hey, Matt. Do you strike that balance between just do something, not paralysis by analysis, and knowing enough that you're not working without progress? So uh, how do you strike, excuse me, that balance? Mm. Excuse me, getting dry out here, folks. That's Denver for you. Uh, so <clears throat> here's, here's the way to know. Track and log. You log things. You have a workout log. I have a very simple workout log that I developed over the years called the scoreboard progression log. It's all it requires is a Google document. If you want to know how to do that, the ebook that explains how to do that is over on the reddeltaproject.com under the free ebooks tab. And uh, it's totally free. <laughs> As the name implies, just click on the link and it's yours. But that's what logging is all about. The log tells you what you need to do. The log shows you if you've done enough. The log tells you if you're making progress. It's no longer any guesswork. That's why my friend who was working out today, he's like, I'm tired, I'm hungover, I don't wanna be here. I'm like, you just need two sets of eight, buddy, or two sets of more than five. How did I know that? I was looking at his log. <laughs> of course, I track everything. I track all my clients. Always beware of a coach that does not track my friends. If you have a coach and they're not writing stuff down, fire that coach. They don't know what they're doing because that writing down, that action of either on a tablet or paper or whatever, that's what tells you what you need to do. Keep a log. And I know it can be tedious. That's why I developed the scoreboard progression log because it's not tedious. And that, that's how you know. And even though it was like, are you sure two sets are enough? Are you sure? You know, it's like, Dude, you did more than before. <laughs> the numbers don't lie. You know, you improved based on what the log told us you needed to improve. Congratulations. <laughs> Pat on the back, high five. Now go get some food and rest up because we know you made improvement. That's how you know is you log. <clears throat> Blue F asking, hey Matt, what's your go-to hip mobility exercises? Depends on what you're talking about, but one of my favorites is pretty simple um, is... I get into a nice wide, well, in Taekwondo, we call them sitting stance, but I guess most people call them horse stances. It's just like a wide stance laterally. And I squat down and I actually, sometimes I'll put my hands on the floor. So I get a little bit of hip flexion in there and just kind of shift back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that's opening up my hip flexors. Um, and then for the lateral hip is uh, um, uh, just a figure four stretch kind of deal, which I'm terrible at. <laughs> I'm really, really bad at. My lateral hips are tight, tight, tight. But uh, those are my best hip uh, go-to, hip mobility exercise. Do those before uh, warming up for my Taekwondo classes. All right, folks, let's get to the last couple ones here real quick. <clears throat> so big game-changing uh, lesson again here. Uh, next one is mind controls muscle, not exercise. This was a huge game changer for me because ultimately there's still this idea in our fitness culture that our muscles are worked by the exercise we do. Uh, bench press works the chest, uh, you know, squats work the quads, uh, pull-ups work the lats, yada, 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 right? It's not under, it's understandable to think how we think of this because we do pull-ups and we're like, yeah, my lats are working, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But it's a cart before the horse kind of deal because ultimately the thing that tells your muscles to work and if they should work 
is your ticker, right? They call it the neuromuscular system for a reason. It's not just the muscles are sitting there until you put a dumbbell in your hand and then they're like, oh, I guess we got to contract here. No, your brain is what tells your muscles what they need to do. Creates a signal, goes down through your spinal cord, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system to the various motor units and they fire off to contract the associated muscle fibers and the all or nothing principle. Basic human physiology 101. And I know a lot of people out there give me criticism about this. They're like, oh, he's talking about the mind-muscle connection. No, I'm not. I'm talking about tension control. Mind-muscle connection is a lot of times we are thinking, oh, it's about thinking about the muscle. No, thinking about the muscle doesn't do you jack. I could look, think about a burnt light bulb all day long. It's not going to turn on. You know, the whole mind-muscle connection in reality is about putting tension in the muscle. I'm not thinking about my lats when I'm doing the pull-ups. I'm thinking about the tension I'm putting in my lats when I'm doing my pull-ups. And make no mistake about it, it's there because my brain puts it there. So if you've ever done an exercise and you're like, God, it's always so hit or miss. Like I do dips and man, I feel it in my chest. The chest is all pumped up and all oh, this feels awesome. And then the next workout, you're like, what's going on? It's not in my chest anymore. It's like all in my shoulders and my shoulders are killing me. What the heck? It's not the exercise, my friends. Don't, don't defer the quality of your muscular contraction and use to the exercise and the weight because the exercise is not ultimately controlling the tension in your muscles. It's not there because you're doing the exercise. It's there because your brain puts it there. And when you get good at putting it there through your concentration, and yes, that is a skill. Yes, it can be improved. And yes, you do need to work on it. That's why I always recommend overcoming isometrics because it's by far the easiest way to learn how to do that. Once you get better at doing that, you'll have so much more control over the work capacity and the tension, you know, satisfying pumps and burning out the muscle every single workout, every set, every rep, every single time is going to bring up the effectiveness of being able to work that muscle to a much higher degree on a much more consistent basis. Because instead of letting the muscle, the uh, exercise control the muscle, which it really doesn't, so you're basically letting it go by chance, you're taking proactive control over that tension and saying, tension, get in that muscle, because I tell you to put in that muscle. And it goes in the muscle every time to the degree you want. And it also helps to protect the hell out of your joints, because if there's stress in the joints, that means it's not in the muscle. So it's your brain that controls the tension in your muscle, not the exercise. The exercise is just the vehicle. That's just the path you're using to necessitate the tension in the muscle. So it's still important. It's still very good. But ultimately, your muscles are doing what they're doing because your brain is telling them to do that thing. And when you understand that and can work on that control through your concentration, everything about your workouts, shoom, skyrockets as far as safety, effectiveness, consistency, and satisfaction. And if you don't have that, well, you're just leaving it up to chance. And you're just crossing your fingers and hoping it's going to work out in the end. So that's what's ultimately controlling the tension in your muscles. Concentration, my friends, concentration. Oh, I guess I already addressed this one. And the last point I had for today was uh, healthy diets satisfy. And I already talked about this with the objectives of uh, healthy eating, your four primal appetites. Again, hunger, nutritional support, and metabolic and energy support, and of course, satisfaction of the other subjective qualities like taste and the emotional needs met with food as well. And that goes completely against, because a lot of times people will tell you that your diets are healthy because of some rule, right? I don't eat sugar. Okay, great. But that's not enough. I don't eat gluten. I don't eat animal products. I, I only eat between these hours and these hours. I only eat these many cows. Okay, fine. These rules are all fine, but they're not enough. They're not even close to enough because the objective of a real true healthy diet is to satisfy your appetites, not to deprive yourself, not to not eat certain foods, not to uh, force yourself to adhere to some sort of subjective arbitrary uh, formula or rules that some expert posted on TikTok somewhere. No, it's about satisfying your appetites. And that's going to give you a much greater chance of actually having a truly healthy diet that supports the exercise and the health and the body that you want. But if you just follow arbitrary rules, like, okay, I don't eat carbs after 7 p.m. or whatever, 
Again, it turns into guesswork. You're crossing your fingers and hoping to get there by luck because someone recommended it on the internet. And once again, it's even worse when people are like, I'm following these rules because this is what this guy on the internet said I should do. Meanwhile, I'm hungry, I'm craving chocolate, and my energy level is terrible, and I kind of feel off like I might be anemic. It's like, yeah, because your experience is telling you this is bad, but you're following the internet as the guiding force anyway. And that's when you've lost the right, you're lost your way. It's when you're no longer in control. You've put someone else or some diet or some rules in control, and your experience is telling you otherwise. Trust your experience, my friends. Trust what your body's telling you. It's got better sense than what someone on the internet, aka like me, is trying to tell you you should be doing. Trust your experience when it comes to your diet and eat to satisfy, my friends. Okay, let's say uh, last chance again in the last couple of questions here before I uh, turn off and I go hit my dart tournament for the night. San Diego is asking, hey, Matt, I know you made a bit video on this in the past. What do you what do you eat each day? But I was wondering if you've changed anything about it. Not a whole lot, no. Um, I mean, lately I've been eating a lot of chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> my mother, she always she always does. This. She sends me care packages every once in a while, and oh my god, she makes the best Toll House chocolate chip cookies. That uh, it's insane. I'm starting to cut back a little bit because I've just been eating way too much. And again, that's that's my experience. I'm like, okay, I'm not even enjoying these things anymore. I'm eating too many of them, sort of thing. So I trust my experience like scale back so that way I enjoy them if I have one or two once in a while rather than eating them all of the time. But no, not a whole lot. I still follow my 3P strategy, of course, every meal. I focus on getting some protein, some plant-based foods, and I manage my portion sizes. Um, let's see. Lately, I've, I've also given up the energy drinks. Um, not any particular reason why. I just kind of was drinking one one day and I was like, eh, I'm over this. I haven't drank any since, uh, so no more energy drinks. Uh, not like I'm trying to stay away from it. I was just like, yeah, I'm done with this. No more of this. Saves me some money too because those things can get expensive when you're drinking a couple of those every day. Uh, but yeah, not a whole lot of change there. But that is something to be mindful of though because one of the ideas in our diet culture I think that's very lacking is, as I was alluding to earlier, that you don't get results from hard work. You get results from improvement. And when it comes to exercise, we can get focused on improvement. I'm lifting more weight, I'm doing more repetitions, I'm improving my technique. Good, progression, that's what I have the log for. Good, I'm making progress in my workouts. But we need to have the same attitude with diet as well. We need to be improving diet over time. You know, again, those arbitrary rules like, okay, I just followed these three rules, I don't eat these foods and I uh, don't eat past this certain time or whatever, great, I'm following these rules. I'm like, okay, good. So what's the next step? How do you improve upon that? We need to keep things improving over time. And it could be something small, right? One of the things that I've improved in my diet is I have added jalapenos to my salads because I like a little bit of spice. That was an improvement in my diet. <laughs> I'm also adding more of my protein sources to my salads as well, just because it makes a more satisfying salad. I used to have like just a little bit of some chicken or some ham or something. And now I'm like, I want to blanket the top of it with a layer of uh, chicken or ham before I eat it, just because it makes for a more satisfying salad. So that's an improvement there as well. So it's, it's these sorts of things that uh, are improvement over time. We need to improve our diets, just like we progress and improve our workouts, my friends. Okay, Joseph Bello, hey Matt, I wanna know if you have a, any other experience I can do instead of jump squats. I've left hip arthritis and it bothers it when I do them. So why are you doing jump squats then? <clears throat> what is the objective? So let's look at the qualities that come from jump squats. Power in the lower body, strength from the lower body, squat movement chain, okay? Why are you doing them? You better have a good reason to be doing them. I don't do jump squats. I could use some power in my lower body. I may, maybe should be doing them to some degree, but I'm still jumping in Taekwondo and stuff like that. So the first thing I would always ask about any type of exercise or training that someone has trouble with is, is it even necessary to do it in the first place? Because if it's not necessary, get rid of it. You know, I always base everything in fitness along those rules is everything that we choose to do should be either desired or required. And most stuff out there isn't required. 
unless your goal is to do the thing itself, then you don't have to do nearly as much as we think we do. So I would say, unless you need to be able to do jump squats for some reason, I wouldn't even do them. I, I just wouldn't even bother with it. You know, you can get power a million different ways. So, you know, maybe uh, can you run upstairs? Uh, that can work. Hill sprint, that can work really well. Weight sled, that can work really well. And you're, you're building power all of these different ways. If you don't want to, uh, if that works with your hip, I would just do those. But I don't see a reason unless you have a reason to do jump squats specifically. I wouldn't even do them. I would just nick them and push them by the wayside. All right, folks, I'm getting a little bit hoarse. It's been an hour here, always the fastest hour of my life. But let me know, uh, is this time better for you Friday afternoon or should I still stick with Saturday afternoon and stuff like that? But uh, we'll try back and forth, see what goes on. But again, the audio for this will be posted on the uh, podcast as well. But thanks very much, folks, for watching, listening, contributing and everything. Like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Leave reviews on your podcast director if you're listening to this in audio. It sincerely helps out the show and supports everything. And as always, the links to all the references and the resources that I mentioned in the show are down below as well. So thanks again, as always, and I'll talk to you guys next week. Till then be fit and live free.